All right, today we're going to talk about how a series of revolutions outside of Texas is going to come to affect Texas in the late 1700s, early 1800s. So last time we talked, essentially Texas was going through a period of relative peace. So the Spanish still didn't have a lot of people in Texas proper. As we've talked about, the way the Spanish understood Texas was this area roughly around here. They only had three settlements in Texas, San Antonio, La Bahia, and Nacogdoches. Uh, in these areas altogether, maybe 3,000, 4,000 citizens, not very many. As we talked about, though, there is going to be a lot of settlements outside of Texas. So, uh, as we've also been discussing, since the first arrival of the Spanish in Texas, they've been having problems with a lot of American Indian groups, particularly the Comanches and the Apaches, but by the late 1700s, owing to deportation of Apaches, allying with the Comanches, establishing these uh, establecimientos de paz where Apaches settled, these Indian reservations, essentially by the end of the 1700s, the Spanish uh, had peacefully settled Texas. And again, part of this owes to the fact that they now uh, have this sort of buffer zone over here, Louisiana. The French are no longer uh, trading in Texas to the Spanish because they control Louisiana, or at least they're going to have some ability to um, keep gun traders and things like that from making contacts with Indians. So, again, things looking up for Spanish Texas by the end of the 1700s. Well, as we're going to talk about, a couple things will happen that will dramatically change the fate of Texas. As we all know and we're all leading up to, in the 1830s, Texas is going to uh, go through a revolution. Well, we're going to talk about a revolution that's going to come up before that. These revolutions are going to be in part the product of something called the Enlightenment. I think we briefly mentioned the Enlightenment before, but just know in the 1700s, we're going to see a lot of people begin to question the way that things are. A lot of these people are from Europe. They are people that have newly acquired wealth. So this would be, you know, in Spain it would be guys that maybe made money in silver mining in, in New Spain, went back to Spain, and then now they're independently wealthy. They're not from a wealthy family. They're not aristocrats. They're not um, royalty. They're not born into wealth. It's just they made money in the new world, or maybe they're parents or, or grandparents made money in the new world but they're not they don't belong to a family with wealth you know this had wealth for generations so think about maybe in England this would be people that went to the new world made money off tobacco then come back to England and they're sitting here have the same amount of money as an aristocrat who only has his money because their great 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 ancestor did a favor for the British king uh, maybe some France, somebody made their money off fishing, something like that. It's just a bunch of new money people that are going to start looking around and saying, why are things the way they are? And they're in particular going to be looking at the wealthy, uh, the people with all the true power in Europe, kings, royals, aristocrats, who hold all these positions in government and rule o over others uh, because their family way back in the Middle Ages or whatever has made money or, or did a favor for a king. So new money people. Again, a lot of these guys are smart entrepreneurs. Well, these guys are going to start meeting up and because they have money, they have wealth where, you know, somebody who would be poor uh, is going to be working all the time, not going to receive an education. These new money people will have an education. Their children are going to have an education. And they're going to have time to discuss uh, things that, again, people without education, people that, that have to work all the time aren't going to be able to discuss. So a lot of these new money people will start meeting in places like this. This would be a, a coffee house in England in you know early 1700s, something like that. So what these new money people are going to do is they're going to sit around and question why are things the way they are. You don't get aristocrats, royals questioning these things because why would they question those things when they're at the top? But if you get somebody right below them with education and they're looking at the guy at the top and they're saying, you know, why why is that person in charge and not me? So these new money people sit at these coffee houses and they start to discuss new ideas. Some of the things they're going to discuss are economics. So there's a guy named Adam Smith. You don't need to know anything about him, but he's going to argue that right as things are in the 1700s, most countries, 
Britain, France, Spain, they limit trade between their colonies just to the home country. So Spanish colonies, except for a handful of items, pretty much if you uh, are buying something in the New World, you're getting it from Spain. And if you're a New World colony, you got to trade directly to Spain. Same thing with the uh, British colonies in North America. Same thing with uh, France uh, or formerly French colonies. Uh, you had to tra trade with France. There's no free trade. Well, a lot of these people are going to start saying, is this hurting people overall? Maybe we should start getting rid of duties, allowing people to trade with whoever they want. So we're going to get some economic discussion during this um, enlightenment period. You also get a lot of scientific discussion. People, why are animals the way they are? Why do crocodiles and alligators look similar? What does, you know, uh, what causes lightning? Um, Benjamin Franklin, one of the fa more famous scientists from the uh, uh, British colonies, it will, you know, do the kite test. We've all heard about that. Uh, to determine if static electricity and lightning are essentially the same thing. And you're going to see a lot of these Europeans, these new money people, start collecting curiosity cabinets like you see displayed here. And all this is is just a collection of items that they've sent off for that, um, you know, that tell them more about nature. It's actually during this enlightenment period where you get scientific classification of animals. So most people know a dog as a dog, but it has a scientific name, two-word name. I don't know what it is, but um, but that, that comes out of this Enlightenment period. Basically, in France, you see a lot of the scientific classification of animals, and this is going to spread uh, to the rest of Europe and eventually to the uh, Americas uh, via the Enlightenment. So um, that's going to be another thing we see discussed in these coffee houses and, and like here, these salons in Europe. Another thing people will discuss is religion. So you're going to see a lot of people, again, these new new money people, a lot of these people that weren't born into wealth, but they, or maybe their parents or grandparents made the wealth, they're going to discuss things like, is God truly divine like he's portrayed in the Bible? Or, you know, is there scientific explanations for things? You know, um, uh you know, you see a lot of questioning, like this American thinker, Thomas Jefferson, will say, is it true that, you know, about the burning bush, Moses parting the Red Sea, are those things uh, true, or is that there another explanation? And you'll see people try to explain the supernatural, things that religion had explained, um, uh, you know, they'll try to explain it in scientific terms. Well, this is going to lead a number of people to begin questioning the political system in Europe and because Europe has colonized the Americas question the political system in the Americas so what we'll see and the reason this is going to happen is because a lot of European politicians base their claim to rule others king queen whatever they say that I am divinely ordained to rule others now this started after the fall of the Roman Empire, basically you had a lot of people uh, claiming land, using military power, calling up their friends, forming these armies, and then grabbing a, a huge chunk of land. And then they would uh, pay off the Pope or whoever to say that once I'm in charge, I'm going to stay in charge because God divinely ordained me to rule. So everybody here under me, peasants, things like that, you happen to listen to me because Pope says, I'm a legitimate ruler. God divinely ordained me to rule. Now, as we talked about, Britain broke away from the Catholic Church, but you still have this idea of monarchs being there because God says they and their descendants are divinely ordained to rule others. Well, during the Enlightenment, as people question religion, they begin to question this divine uh, right to rule. And so you're going to see a lot of people advocating things like Republican government, where instead of having a king, instead of having a queen, you have elections for representatives, or somehow you get representatives to uh, you know pass laws for the people instead of just this guy who was born into this position uh, making rules for others. Okay, so uh, we start to see the, this questioning of government during the Enlightenment. Well, the thing is with the Enlightenment, it's going to be prominent mostly in France, but you will see a lot of it spread to Spain. You'll see some of it spread to Britain. Now, thing with Spain, it's not going to spread as much, in particular because 
the Spanish uh, king bans a lot of literature, especially that concerning the uh, questioning of religion and questioning of the divine rights rule. Now, Britain isn't going to have as strict of restrictions on the press. Same thing, same thing with France. And for this reason, we'll see a lot of people in Britain and, and a lot of people in the British colonies, as a matter of fact, reading this Enlightenment literature, questioning the British right to rule. Now, we're going to get to the point where we see Spain, uh, Spanish people question it as well. But just know that you have a lot of these people in, in uh, British uh, colonies uh, reading this thing and saying, maybe we should have a representative form of government. And in particular, you're going to see these uh, British North American colonies, these 13 colonies uh, on the eastern coast of North America. These Americans are going to start saying, maybe we should form a representative government instead of having Britain rule over us. And now, Britain had established somewhat similar rules to Spain in that they kept their colonies in a subordinate position economically. They forced them to uh, sell certain goods to the British. They couldn't trade directly with other countries. Um, and they didn't allow them representation in Parliament. And in uh, post Seven Years' War, you know, 1763 to 1774, we're going to see the British begin imposing new taxes and, and uh, duties on these American colonies. And these colonists hopped up on Enlightenment literature beginning around 1774, 1775. We'll start uh, uh, fighting against the British or um, rebelling against the British. And what's going to culminate in the American Revolution in 1776. Now, we can't get into this American Revolution too much, but... Just know, you know, the British, one of the most powerful countries in the world, it's going to be difficult for these Americans to achieve their independence, but they eventually will by 1783, and uh, after a series of different battles, the British will have to recognize that these Americans are independent from Britain. Now, the interesting thing is Spain will join these colonists in their fight against Britain. So, 1776, the fighting begins. Uh, the Spanish are going to look at these colonists and in part there's going to be this question should we support them because hey they're fighting to become independent from the king we don't want our colonists to have independence so why should we support these guys it might give our colonists some ideas so there's some hesitance initially to join the colonists there's also some hesitance because they don't know if they're going to be successful um, but ultimately the Spanish king and queen will decide after a couple of years of fighting, when the colonists look like they might have a chance at the Brit against the British, the Spanish will end up joining the colonists. What, what they're thinking here is that if they win, it will rob the British of some of their uh, most important money-making areas. Uh, so they got a lot of goods from these colonists. So if these colonists become independent, this is going to hurt the British. Hurt, whatever hurts the British is good for the Spanish. So 1778, the Spanish will join the war against the British. Now what they're going to do is, uh, oh, part of the reason is because they want to recover Florida, which they lost to the British in the Seven Years' War. So the only real major way we're going to see the Spanish fight the British is they will uh, launch some invasions from uh, Louisiana into this British Florida area. They're going to have a sea invasion from Cuba to retake Florida, and they'll successfully retake this area in 1779. Texas doesn't play a huge part in the American Revolution. If anything, you will see uh, a, a handful of Texas ranchers ship uh, cattle over here to uh, Louisiana, and this cattle is going to be shipped to uh, support the, the colonial army. So Texas doesn't play a huge part in the American Revolution, although the Spanish, again, do fight in the American Revolution. So by 1783, these 13 colonies are going to achieve their independence, and what they're going to do is they're going to form something called the United States of America. Now, initially it's going to be under this Articles of Confederation government with an incredibly weak national government. States have most of the power, but by 1789 they're going to switch to a more... Um, national uh, control government. States will still have some power, but it it is going to be a Republican government, and it's going to have a tiny bit of democracy involved in it as well. So not as democratic as the United States today, or even the dem democratic as the United States will be by the mid-1800s, 
but it, it's still democratic republic in a world where the rest of the countries are controlled by kings. So what does all of this mean for Texas? Well, one thing, and this is a lesser thing, you see Spain gets back Florida, not really a huge thing for Texas, but that's going to be something on a the map. There'll be somewhat of a dispute between this new United States and uh, Spain over this area here, you know, some disagreement over who controls that. But we'll see a big thing that's going to come out of this is that you know, this, this American Revolution will give ideas to Spaniards, okay? Some of the Spanish are going to look at these guys, hey, they fought off a king, and they installed a Republican government, Democratic government, and now essentially they're controlling their own economy, their own politics, instead of the British king way across the ocean. Couldn't we do that over here? Couldn't we fight off our king? Couldn't we um, rule our own economy? So you're going to see a number of Spaniards in New Spain and throughout the rest of the Spanish colonies as well start questioning the, uh, the status quo, why things are the way they are. Now in particular, this is those Criollos, the people of European ancestry born in the Americas, they're going to be the ones questioning why the uh, way things are, uh, they'll be questioning why things are the way they are. Now the Criollos, the one, reason they're the ones questioning things is because they're really the only ones in the Americas that aren't directly benefiting from Spanish control and they're the only ones that ha besides those uh, in control that have an education. So the Peninsulares at top, they're not going to question things. Those ones from Spain because they are the ones in power. They control a good chunk of the economics of New Spain. They're over here. They hold the high political positions. You're not going to question things if, um, if you're in charge. But the Criollos, again, you could look at them as the middle class of the Americas. They are um, allowed some political positions, not the top political positions. They do have some wealth. You know, generally they're merchants, um, the people working under the Peninsulares. So you have this educated class that has somebody look uh, on top of them, and they say, why can't I be the one to control this money. So you're going to see throughout the uh, Spanish Americas, some of these Criollos start saying, maybe I, I, we should be in power. Maybe we should do what these British colonies did. Now, you will have people saying this, but you're not going to see a war for independence right at the same time as you see the Americans revolt. Now, why is this the case? couple things is, you know, there's a couple explanations why you don't see, you know, the people of New Spain rise up like the people in the Americas. Some people argue that it's because Spain simply kept more soldiers in the Americas than the British kept in North America. British kept very few soldiers, so um, this allowed people to congregate, to s openly discuss revolution. Spanish have soldiers all over the place here. They have an army made up of peninsulares, criollos, actually a handful of mestizos as well. And these guys are everywhere. So um, anybody discussing revolution, you're going to have peninsulares being able to shut that down quicker than the British would over here. Some people argue that it's because of the Catholic t uh, Church ties to uh, the Criollos and the people of New Spain. Basically over here, the Americans, a lot of them uh, hopped up on the Enlightenment. You know, the, the fact, the nature of the Protestant church, there's not a, a church hierarchy that sort of uh, keeps things under control. Well, the Catholic church, very hierarch hierarchical. You have, um, you know, again, bishops, uh, they have priests, things like that. And this Catholic Church hierarchy is very tied into local politics, and most priests support Spain because the Spanish government provides money to priests, you know, supports the, um, their efforts to preach to the people of the Americas. We've talked about the ties between Catholic Church and Spanish government before. So just know that, um, Again, you know, uh, priests are going to use their influence, most priests are going to use their influence to make sure that people stay faithful to Spain. Um, you'll also, geography might play a factor. So in the rest of Spanish America, messages between one group and another are going to be hard to pass because mountains everywhere, uh, like if you go to a place like Colombia, it's all mountains. 
if you're a group of revolutionaries in Colombia, you maybe are thinking about starting an independence movement throughout the Americas, simply delivering a message to, say, Mexico, um, you know, state of Mexico, New Spain in general, it's going to take a lot longer than a message from relatively flat Georgia to Massachusetts. So geography is going to be another factor, people say. Um, consistent taxation. So one of the reasons we saw the revolt in the American colonies is because after the Seven Years' War, the British were in debt. They asked their American colonists to pay additional uh, tax money. Well, the Spanish had been consistently charging the same taxes since really the 1500s, so they're not going to be asking for additional money. They're not changing the system very much, um, whereas the British suddenly changed the system uh, 1763, and it sort of was a shock to the Americans. So they've always, always charged this 20% tax as Quinto Real uh, in the Spanish colonies. Um, you could also argue less access to enlightenment literature. So Spain kept a pretty tight uh, control over the books that are talking about uh, revolution, things like that. I mean, some of those books will inevitably get their hands uh, weighed in the hands of Criollos, but they were much harder to get than over here in the American colonies where the British uh, government relatively uh, free press. And also over here, because Protestants, they basically... Um, they have this focus on education because instead of a priest uh, telling you the way to read the Bible, you're supposed to read the Bible yourself. So literacy rates are generally higher in British Protestant uh, colonies than they are over here. So you do have a lot of Criollos that uh, can read and write, but even even the literacy rates among Criollos would be lower over here. So less people simply uh, reading Enlightenment literature than you have over here. Probably the biggest factor that's going to prevent these uh, uh, these Criollos and the people of New Spain from revolting is the fact that Criollos recognize that there's a big caste system. And they understand that while they're below the Peninsulares in this caste system, there are a lot of people below them and a lot of uneducated people who a lot of the Criollos fear that if... Um, if they begin to revolt, those below them, the mestizos, the uh, Indians, the uh, mulattoes, the uh, Africans still kept as slaves, those a number have been freed, but they're at the bottom of the social ladder, that if they revolt against the peninsulares, you'll have these groups below them say, well, why can't I revolt? And so uh, what you have here is a, a basic... Um, structure of the uh, New Spain at the time at the top you see Peninsulares were actually only about 15,000 in uh, New Spain at the time. Criollo is about a million but if you look at this the majority of the population of New Spain is going to be uh, mestizos and Indians. Criollos want to be at the top of this uh, pyramid. They want to get rid of the Peninsulares. They want to take over the politics and the government of New Spain but a lot of them fear that if we try to do this and uh, the people below us see the people at the top fighting, they're going to want to get to the top of the pyramid. So there's going to be a f essentially a fear of race war uh, if, this, um, if the revolution starts in, um, uh, in the Spanish colonies. So this is one of the major effects of that American Revolution. It gets Criollos questioning things. But they're not, not questioning enough to revolt because of these other uh, reasons. So another reason this American Revolution will affect Texas and New Spain in general is going to be because when the British lose control over this area, it basically is going to put a group of expansionist Americans right next to the Spanish. So prior to the American Revolution, the British had basically told its colonists, you can't settle west of these Appalachian Mountains. They'd preserved this area essentially for Indian groups. So Mississippi culture groups down here, other Indian groups up here. And they'd drawn this something called this proclamation line saying you can't settle west of the Appalachian Mountains. Well, when the British are overthrown, what this is going to do is open this area for settlement. And so, um, so proclamation of a line of 1763 is gone. 
Now you've got a lot of people that are hungry for land over here. You have a United States government that's willing to uh, essentially uh, allow people to settle in areas where Indians are present. And you're going to start seeing Americans just pour over these mountains and start settling areas where previously the British government had, um, had denied them uh, the ability to settle. So you start to see the population post-1783 over in this area dramatically increase. Now this is a huge problem for Spain because in the time that they had taken over Louisiana from the French, the Spanish hadn't brought a whole heck of a lot of people in here. As a matter of fact, the majority of the population in Louisiana is still people of French ancestry. You have a handful of Spanish soldiers in Louisiana, you have a handful of Spanish politicians, but this, uh, the people here remain pretty much French. And again, maybe some French fur traders up here, but the Spanish themselves don't have a lot of control. So you got a lot of Americans coming in and few Spaniards to block them. So the Spanish, what we'll see beginning right after 1783, it's almost as if they are going to come to quickly re regret helping the American colonists because they're going to start passing a series of laws meant to slow American expansion uh, west. Essentially, they want to buy themselves time to further populate, populate Louisiana to try and serve as a buffer to the United States. So one thing we're going to see the Spanish do, 1784, they're going to shut down this Mississippi River to American commerce. So right here is New Orleans. They'll basically put a bunch of cannons here, blockade the end of this, and they'll say to the Americans, you cannot trade through here. That's a big deal because Americans moving west of the Appalachian Mountains, if you want to get your goods to market, say you're growing wheat or whatever, apples, something like that, and you want to get your stuff to market over here, going over a mountain is going to take a lot of time, a lot of transportation costs. It doesn't look like it's very far, but simply tra uh, going across this area is going to cost so much. By the time you get it to market on land, uh, it, it, you know your goods are going to be rotten, moldy, something like that. So if you're moving west and you want to make money, you're going to have to get on a river, bring your goods to market by sea. Well, Spain says, nope, you can't do that any longer. Uh, we're cutting you off. So their thought process is we discourage people from moving west by cutting off the economic incentive to move west. So that's one thing the Spanish will do. Another thing they're going to do is start providing arms to these Mississippi culture Indians in this area. So you have... Uh, these are groups we hadn't talked about in a long time. You you know, like the um, Mississippi Culture Indians. Again, as we mentioned, they've gone through a series of diseases. Their population has been reduced significantly. They no longer as the height of their power like when DeSoto saw them. But you still have a number of large populations here of Mississippi Culture Indians, in particular these Cherokees, Choctaws, Chickasaws, Creeks. And what Spain is going to do is say the more powerful these guys are, the um, more powerful these guys are, the less or the, the more they're going to be able to resist Americans from expanding into this region. So we'll provide these guys with weapons. So the Spanish start to arm Indians in this area to deter American expansion westward. So that's one thing the Spanish will do. Um, shut down the Mississippi, provide arms to uh, Indians. Another thing they're going to do is start to pay off some of these early settlers in this, this area. So most of the American colonists that have moved west after 1783 are living in this area, Kentucky, Kentucky Tennessee. They've started gra grabbing land here. Well, after Spain shuts down the Mississippi, a lot of these guys are going to be looking around, not making very much money. The American government, United States government, and these state governments all the way across these Appalachian Mountains, uh, again, back then, transportation wasn't great, so they're not really being ruled by the government over here. They're essentially on their own in this western area. You don't have a lot of patriotism at this time because you know, people don't know how long this new United States is going to last. So what the Spanish will start doing is sending these messengers to meet with prominent officials, prominent individuals uh, over here. And they're going to try to buy their loyalty, almost to the point where they are going to start um, promoting secession from the United States. So they'll start sending silver, gold here to these prominent individuals and have them pushing the idea of potentially breaking away from the United States. 
So you're going to see guys like this guy, James Wilkinson. He moved to Kentucky, one of the first American settlers west of the Appalachians. The Spanish government meets with him. They start discussing you know, potential trade deals with him. They start paying him silver, and they start telling him, go to the people of Kentucky, encourage them to break away from the United States. So this James Wilkinson guy, you know, officially a part of this new United States, but in reality, he's uh, he's going to be an agent of Spain. All right, so that's uh, something else the Spanish will do. So this American Revolution, again, huge effect on New Spain in general, and as we're going to see, it's going to later have a big effect on Texas, giving the Spanish uh, colonists ideas, and then also uh, bringing this problem for Spain by seeing these Americans now settling west of the Appalachian Mountains. So that's one revolution that's going to have an impact on Texas that happens in the late 1700s. The second revolution that's going to impact Texas in Spanish colonies in general is going to be this revolution that breaks out in 1789 in France. Okay, so France over here, north of Spain. The French have been ruled by a French king for a very long period of time. Well, 1780s, after the Seven Years' War, the people of France will start being taxed to repay the, the cost of this war and actually added on to the fact the American Revolution, the French helped the Americans during the American Revolution. This cost the French government a lot of money. So in the 1780s, the French uh, government, the French king, increases taxes on the French people. And not only that, but the French, they're reading the same Enlightenment literature that the Americans had read, and they also just saw how the Americans broke away from Britain and established their own government. And so you'll see some people in France calling for uh, an end to the French monarchy. And what's going to begin to happen in 1789 is these French peasants will rise up and they will start to attack, uh, you know, the French soldiers start to attack monarchs. And it's not, uh, it's not just going to be the royals. The French people, the vast majority of whom are very poor, will essentially call for a war on all the aristocrats in France. Just about everybody with money will become a target for the poor in, in France. And so this French Revolution is going to be different than the American Revolution in that way. American Revolution, in a sense, was wealthy middle, middle class people versus you know British aristocrats. This is going to be the poor versus the wealthy. Uh, you know, not exclusively, but it, we'll see a lot of uh, people with money having their heads chopped off. And in a lot of ways, the French Revolution is going to be more chaotic than the American Revolution. American Revolution was, by the way, one group who wanted to break away from the king, form a republic, versus a group that wanted to stay with the king. French Revolution is not going to be that way because you'll have some people pushing for um, the king, uh, staying in absolute monarchy. You'll have other people saying, all right, I like being under a king. But I want, uh, I think you should be limited by a constitution. You'll have other people who will um, be saying we should have a republic like the United States. Other people saying we should have a full democracy. Uh, other people will be saying essentially anarchy. And so you have all these groups fighting one another. And, um, and, and it's going to be chaos. It's going to be much more chaotic than what happened in the American Revolution. In addition, we'll see in this French Revolution... Once you get a, a tiny bit of stability, stability in 1793, you'll see that the French government that takes over is going to almost immediately after gaining stability will declare war on all of the kings of Europe. So beginning in, uh, I'm sorry, 1793, we start seeing France versus the rest of Europe. So Americans, once they got their independence, were content to be left alone. The French will um, the French will declare war on all kinks. So we'll have this uh, war between France and Spain. Spain will join the the fight against the French. Spain and France are usually allies, but not at this point. 1793, they go to war, and once again we're gonna have Britain and France go to war. We had them go to war, Seven Years' War, once again in the American Revolution, and here they are again during this French Revolution. Uh, we have France fighting. Okay. So what does this all mean for people of the Americas and Texas? So one thing this means is that the Spanish are going to be uh, divide, devoting a lot of their attention to fighting France. So instead of paying attention to the Americas, Spain's going to send all its soldiers and money to fighting the French up here 
uh, in the Pyrenees Mountains. You know, the French try to invade. No, we're not going to let you. Uh, so that's one thing. Another thing is, just like had happened in the American Revolution, the French Revolution will inspire some Spaniards, particularly these Criollos over in the New World, hey, maybe we should do what they're doing, break away from our king. Probably the biggest impact, though, that this French Revolution will have on Texas and the Spanish America is that it's going to, at the end of this revolution, put an expansionist emperor in power of France. So this guy, Napoleon Bonaparte, um, he had been a French general during the revolution. He's fighting for all these revolutionary ideals. Well, by 1799, the French are essentially tired of the chaos. France, you know, much more bloodier revolution than happened in the Americas, whereas the American Revolution in total, there were some 8,000 deaths during the French Revolution. Um, there's going to be something like 40,000 deaths every year, so people are going to be dying left and right. One government takes over, gets overthrown by another government. You have wars with all of Europe. Well, in 1799, the French people are tired, and this is going to allow this French general, Napoleon Bonaparte, to take over the government by um, by uh, essentially mobilizing the French army behind him. And once he does that, the French people are going to look at this Napoleon guy, and they understand that by putting power in, the, in an authority figure like Napoleon, they're giving up some of their revolutionary ideals, again, people calling for republican democracy. But people are so tired of fighting that it's essentially choosing almost to, to put in another king, not not name emperors, uh, I'm sorry, Napoleon's an emperor, but in uh, practice, you know, he's going to be essentially a king. So we're going to put this guy in power, and, uh, and so he will get authority around himself in 1799, and the French Revolution, and the wars uh, with Europe. But Napoleon, once he gets power, he's going to look around and say, all right, it's only a matter of time before we, the French, get in another fight. Particularly he's looking at Britain saying, all right, I know we, we fought with them, Seven Years War, American Revolution, now here again in the French Revolution. We will be fighting them again. So what Napoleon is going to try to do before the next war that comes with Britain is he will try to expand French power, get money coming into France so he can rebuild France's armies that got decimated during the French Revolution. He wants to build a French navy. So what Napoleon's going to do, 1799, 1800, is he's going to look around the, uh, uh, you know, look around France, look at its remaining colonies, and say, how can I make some money? Well, one of the things that Napoleon is going to look at is he looks at the North America and he says, boy, I kind of wish we didn't get rid of uh, this Louisiana area. And the reason he starts saying, I wish we didn't get rid of Louisiana is not because Louisiana made France a ton of money. As a matter of fact, it probably cost France a lot of money, but because there's another area of the French Empire that had been making a lot of money for France, and Napoleon thinks that if the French owned Louisiana again, it could help this area. And the area that he's talking about is this island just uh, that used to be Hispaniola, this western half of this uh, island that's today. Uh, Haiti. This was one of the few remaining places in the Americas, really the only major uh, colony left in the Americas that the French owned, and this had been making the French a ton of money. So throughout the 1700s, the French had been, after taking this area from Spain, had been growing sugar on Haiti. Um, sugar, as we all know, simple carbohydrate, our bodies love it because it's easy to break down. It gives a lot of energy without having to take a lot of energy to digest it. So, you know, um, a lot of physics, chemistry and stuff involved there, but just our bodies taste it and say we really like it. So humans want sugar. Sugar can only grow in certain areas, hot climates where it doesn't ever freeze. Haiti is one of these perfect places to grow sugar. France takes it from Spain. French realized this, and so what they start doing in the 1700s is importing hundreds of thousands and actually millions of African slaves into Haiti to grow as much sugar as possible, and they essentially turn Haiti into a uh, sugar-growing empire for France. France just made tons of money off Haiti during the 1700s. 
uh, by forcing African slaves to grow sugar. And then they'd export the sugar to France, sell it uh, at the market, and the French government would take it a chunk of whatever the uh in taxes and duties from sugar and they would use this money you know for various uh, uh you know government things like soldiers stuff like that well napoleon he looks at haiti and he says i would love to make uh, uh haiti uh, even more profitable so one of the issues with haiti after france france took it over was that you can't grow use all the land in Haiti for sugar and this is because uh, you need to feed slaves you need to feed the people on, on, in Haiti and by the way by uh, 1790 or so Haiti is about 90 percent African slaves um, and so you have to feed these slaves well that means that uh, some of the land has to be devoted to growing food and this is an even bigger problem because you know, France and Britain are always getting fights, and the British have a better navy. So, if the British cut off Haiti, you need to have a lot of land devoted to food, or else, you know, the people on the island will starve. The sugar is going to completely stop being produced. So, what Napoleon says is, how can we feed Haiti without and and take this land? So, let's say 25% is being grown for sugar. Let's take the other 75% which is being grown for food. How can I convert this other 75% into growing sugar? Because more sugar I have, the more money I have. And so France will st sit here looking around saying, how can I get food? Well, this is where Napoleon is going to look at Nap uh, Louisiana and say, boy, I wish we still had this area. And so in um, 1800, Napoleon will approach the King of Spain with an offer. Basically he's going to say we'll give you a little bit of land here in Italy, France owns some land here in Italy in exchange for returning Louisiana to us. So here's a little bit of money, here's some land in Italy, in exchange you return Louisiana to us. Well the Spanish king, this doesn't sound like a very good deal, but the way Spanish king is looking at things is Louisiana right now isn't making us a whole heck of a lot of money. It's simply not. It's um, uh, uh, we've got a lot of Spanish officials here. We've got Spanish soldiers here, but it's not making us a lot of money. We're getting a little bit of, of money off agriculture, some money off tobacco here, but it's not making us a lot of money. And they also look at the fact that the United States is right next door. In spite of their efforts, we're st uh, shutting down the Mississippi, paying off officials, uh, arming Indians. There's still Americans pouring in. And so the Spanish are going to say, you know, if we give this area to France, then they'll bring in their soldiers. Napoleon's got these great armies. This will build up sort of a buffer that we can't afford to put up to U.S. expansion. Sure, it's going to put the French back in here next to our stuff, but we would rather have the French next door to us because we don't we think they're going to bring in enough people to defend against American expansion. But we don't think they're going to bring enough people to uh, essentially take uh, our silver move in down here. So enough to blockade the Americans, but not enough to threaten our possessions. So the Spanish king in 1800 will agree to sell Louisiana back to France. And so in 1800, France will uh, be handed, Spain will hand France back to Spain. Now, it's going to take some years before French officials arrive to retake control of French Louisiana, but the deal is made in 1800. And so Napoleon's got this. Now, all he needs to do is feed, um, uh, send his officials there, get things, uh, food growing, and then start sending it down to Haiti. Well, unfortunately for Napoleon, but as we'll talk about fortunately for the people of Haiti, there's going to be something that puts a hiccup in his plans. And that's going to be something called the Haitian Revolution. This is going to be another revolution that's going to impact Texas. So, 1789, same time as the French Revolution, uh, starting over in France, we're going to see a revolution begin in Haiti. Now, this revolution is not going to start from the slaves in Haiti. It's actually going to be the, a, a group in, in Haiti known as Free Blacks. Okay, So the Haitian population, 1789, is made up of 3% whites. These are the ones who own the plantations, ones who uh, you know, uh, are in charge of slaves, things like that. These are the ones that hold political positions. These are the ones that control the vast majority of the economy 
of Haiti. So this is the, um, you can think of them as almost the peninsulares of Haiti. And then again, you have the 90% enslaved blacks. This would be this group that forced to do manual labor, not uh, denied an education. This group is, uh, again, um, not being able to read and write in literature or anything like that. But you're going to have a group that's about 7% of the population that you would call free blacks. Okay, So this free black population is going to be the children, generally, of whites that go to Haiti have sexual relations with slaves and the product of this relations will be these uh, free blacks. Well, what uh, differs the French from the British is that the French will generally free children that are the product of a master-slave relation and a lot of times they actually give them uh, inheritance and then once they uh, reach a certain age um, they're going to be allowed certain rights in Haitian society. Now they're going to be denied the top positions in government. They're not going to be allowed in, to do certain things economically. But free blacks will receive educations. Uh, you know, the parents will usually provide them educations. Uh, they are going to be allowed positions in government, not things as high as governor, but you will have local city council positions. You know, um, militias. They're going to be allowed to serve in militias. Uh, you know, so uh, firearms training, things like that. But again, they're denied the top part of, ha of uh, Haitian society. Um, the French will have laws against non-whites holding certain positions, but other middle-class positions, I guess you would say, uh, will, will be open to free blacks. So this is, again, very similar to what you see in New Spain. Top of the uh, thing, you have the, the people of French ancestry, free blacks sort of op occupying the middle class. Majority of Haitian population is enslaved. Well, 1789, same time that the French Revolution breaks out, these Haitian uh, free blacks in Haiti will, uh, again, be reading some of the same Enlightenment literature that led to the French Revolution, read, led to the American Revolution, they're going to start revolting against the 3% white uh, population in Haiti to, to take over the economic political reins of Haiti. And so this revolution begins as what you would call a sort of class war. You have the upper class whites, middle class um, uh, free blacks, and then you have the 90% enslaved population. Initially, they're not really going to be involved here. The free blacks are actually hoping to take over the top percentage to themselves become the masters of the plantation and control the politics of Haiti. There's no talk about ending slavery initially. Well, uh, because the white population owns most of the arms in Haiti, uh, they have most of the wealth, you'll see the free black population will not be able to defeat the white population from 1789 to 1791, and it looks like this revolution is stalled. Well, it's at this point the free blacks are going to make a decision to uh, tell the enslaved population that if you join us in our fight then we will give you uh, your freedom. So this is going to essentially turn free black population and the enslaved population against the white population and what had been a class war will essentially turn to a race war. And what we'll see is this um, a bloody fighting for about a period of 10 years as the free blacks and, and now former enslaved population will start for, uh, fighting the whites in Haiti. And basically what you'll see is uh, whites will control the cities, uh, free blacks and enslaved population will control the countryside. Um, this thing is going to be brutal. There's going to be atrocities on both sides. A lot of fighting, a lot of chaos uh, in Haiti. Well, Napoleon buys Louisiana knowing that this Haitian revolution is going on. But what he thinks is that he can bring order to the Haitian Revolution. So he had brought uh, order to the French Revolution. Basically, the people had chosen stability over um, chaos. They, and Napoleon thinks when he buys Louisiana, he's going to be able to bring order to Haiti because the people of Haiti would rather have order than they would have freedom. Actually, he thinks that he's going to be able to send some soldiers in and people of Haiti after 10 years of fighting and you know, all this violence will accept the soldiers. He actually even thinks former slaves will accept being enslaved rather than uh, uh, being this chaos of bloodshed they saw during the Haitian Revolution. And he thinks he can reinstall French power. Once he reinstalls French power then the French can get the sugar plantations going again. 
he can then start sending in the food from Louisiana, sugar back to France, and then that sugar he can convert into weapons for his armies, ships for uh, his navy, and then you know we can go go to war, beat the beat the British. So in 1800, um, the uh, French will get together an army of 30,000 men, and they will send it to Haiti with the idea of defeating the um, you know the uh, freed black and the um, uh, former enslaved population, defeating their armies, and then re-enslaving the population of Haiti. Well. They get the French army, again, one of the best trained armies in the world. Napoleon, you know, these guys have been through fighting themselves back in France for 10 years, uh, fighting in uh, different countries in Europe for 10 years. Napoleon's this great military general. Well, these 30,000 man army gets to Haiti, 1801, and immediately they realize we've got a problem. One, the French, they're from cooler climate. Haiti's got a lot of, uh, it's a tropical environment, disease passes rather easily, and a good chunk of the French army will come down with malaria, yellow fever, these tropical diseases that are very deadly to those who don't um, get them as children, develop uh, childhood immunities, or have inherited immunities to them. And so the French army will be decimated by disease. The remaining uh, French army will try to fight the free blacks um, and former enslaved population in a series of battles, but they're going to underestimate them. Again, a number of the free blacks had been educated uh, just on the same military manuals that the French had. And so in a series of battles, including the one depicted here, the Battle of Veritieres, the uh, free black population will defeat uh, Napoleon's army. By 1803, as a matter of fact, the French army has dropped from 30,000 down to 7,000. And so what Napoleon's going to be uh, essentially forced to this position to recognize we're not going to get Haiti back, okay? And I, I kind of want you to think about this as if uh, Napoleon's sitting there in his desk, he gets a call from his commander in Haiti, and this guy says, we've been defeated in battle, our army's wiped out from disease, we're not getting Haiti back, so, so sorry here, Napoleon. So Napoleon has just bought Louisiana, couple years before, and as a matter of fact, French officials are just just arriving in Louisiana to take it over from Spain, and um, now he, he learns that the whole reason he bought Louisiana was to feed Haiti. Haiti's not coming back, so what are we going to do with this Louisiana? Well, I want you to imagine Napoleon's getting this news at his desk. It doesn't happen exactly this way, but close enough, but he gets a knock on his door, and this knock happens to come from this new uh, uh, these ambassadors from this new United States. The United States is under a president. Um, this is uh, an elected official that is uh, uh, at the top of the Republican government. He had name is Thomas Jefferson. He had grown concerned because he saw the French uh, moving into uh, this new area. He was a little concerned about that, but. And what he wanted to do was simply buy this Thomas Jefferson guy, just wanted to buy this part of Louisiana, this edge over here, the eastern part of the Mississippi River, so the United States could not be cut off uh, from the Mississippi like Spain to cut them off. We want to control at least half of the Mississippi so we can start populating this area again. So these American ambassadors go to Napoleon, and they're just trying to buy this area for $10 million. Well, Napoleon says, I can't get Haiti back. Um, well... I don't need any of this anymore. And so what he's going to say to these American ambassadors is, 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 I'll tell you guys what, you give me 15 million, you take the whole thing. So France will sell the United States this Louisiana purchase that they had just bought from Spain. And now the French are going to have to inform the Spanish that, hey, um, I know you know, you were expecting us to come in here, serve as a buffer for you guys, but we've now just sold this to the country that you were wanting a buffer against. So now those guys are right at your doorstep, okay? So how is this going to affect Texas and New Spain? Well, one way is that the Haitian Revolution is actually going to deter Criollos from, uh, from revolting. So as we've been talking about French Revolution, American Revolution, Man, looks like those guys are breaking away from their king. Maybe we should do that. Well, the Haitian Revolution is an example to these Criollos. If we break away, then the people under us, Indians, um, uh, mestizos, they might rise against us. This is essentially what happened in the Haitian Revolution. 
the other thing this Haitian Revolution uh, is going to to uh, uh, do again this Louisiana Purchase this is going to set off this huge problem for the Spanish in Texas first problem is they don't nobody knows exactly what the Louisiana Purchase includes when Napoleon had bought this from Spain they essentially bought it on the claim from La Salle so La Salle way back when had said all the rivers flowing into the Mississippi and all the land touching those rivers is part of Louisiana well we have all these rivers flowing in so it includes this area but then as we talked about La Salle had actually settled down here in Matagorda so does this area also included in Louisiana well the Spanish are obviously as we're going to talk about are going to say no because we've been living in this area for a long time but you know what claim do we have you know so the Spanish are going to have to now deal with this United States and they're also going to have to find a way now Texas is once again a, a frontier province a buffer province before you had Louisiana to serve as uh, sort of the buffer but now this puts Texas back in this position well it seems fortunate for Spain that at least we were gonna have some time so Americans have been coming over these mountains uh, and they're gonna be coming over even more because now the Mississippi can't be shut down by the Spanish but you know even with the Americans coming over the mountains the Spanish thought alright we've still got a couple years before Americans are really gonna start piling in here um, so maybe we have 10 years 20 years 30 years before this becomes a problem so at least we're gonna have a couple decades to build up the population in Texas to serve as a buffer again you know you have at this point uh, off the top of my head some three four million Americans and you only have four thousand people in in, uh, um, in Texas but you know if we get a couple decades it's gonna take a while for a substantial part of the population to move over here so we have some time well unfortunately for the Spanish in Texas right at the same time that the United States purchases Louisiana something is going to happen a different revolution that is going to dramatically increase the westward expansion of Americans and this revolution is going to be very different than previous revolutions it's it's actually going to be a technological revolution and a revolution that's going to involve a um, a crop not a revolution where people are fighting one another and this revolution is going to be something called the cotton revolution okay um, so by the way this is uh, what the US is going to claim the Louisiana purchase is uh, this is what the Spanish actually don't think it's this much as a sort of like a in between which you side claim but this final revolution we're going to talk about is this cotton revolution so thing is before we talk about how this revolution is going to affect Texas we should talk about cotton so if you look at the back of your shirt vast majority of people are probably wearing shirts that are made of cotton you know the uh, majority of the shirts made of cotton maybe a little bit of polyester in there there's a reason for this you know cotton breathable fiber keeps you hot when it's uh, cold keeps you cool when it's hot you know it wicks moisture meaning uh, moisture evaporates very quickly you compare this to other material like uh, wool which is what actually most people wore into the 1700s early 1800s that's itchy once you sweat in it it stays wet for a long time uh, you know it's it doesn't keep you very uh, it keeps you warm in the winter but doesn't keep you very cool in the summer it's not very pleasant to wear well cotton's different you know it's again if you wear it you're you're gonna be a lot more comfortable than any other material even things like the uh, materials they had at the time like silk silk if you could get silk clothing uh, first that's gonna be very expensive because the only places uh, where you can acquire silk is China and India and you know not much trade with there what little there is is, is going to be expensive silk tears really easily um, again doesn't keep you very warm other materials like linen you know that's itchy doesn't uh, it's hard to uh, to clean it um, and again wool's got its problems polyester wasn't around they didn't have the technology for it back then so cotton today we regard it as a superior fiber back then they regarded it as a superior fiber as well but having said all that, before 1803 or so, maybe a little bit tiny bit before this, very few people wore clothes made of cotton. As a matter of fact, in Europe and the Americas, maybe 4% of clothes were made of, of cotton. Rest, you know, other things like uh, like wool. 
well why would they be growing this and wearing this in these inferior fibers when they have this good stuff cotton well the issue was prior to late 1700s early 1800s prior to this cotton revolution making cotton clothing and growing cotton was so difficult that it was uh, limiting okay so in order to produce this the only place in the world that produced this cotton in, in bulk that um, you know uh, was Egypt Egypt they had this long fiber cotton but it didn't grow all over Egypt and a few places it did grow it, it did grow you know once you you pick the cotton it, you had to process it processing it took a long time you had to remove seeds from it you had to um, uh, you, you then had to uh, weave it into cloth which is going to take a long time and that made uh, cotton really expensive and again only really grown in Egypt well what people discover around the late 1700s is that there is a type of cotton uh, that grew in Mexico Aztecs actually had a little bit of this uh, called upland cotton that actually goes really well in this area of uh, the United States. It's this part of North America. It grows really well down here. Let me get a good picture of it. But the problem with this upland cotton, it was a very hard to process. It had these short staples, which uh, instead of being the long, having the long hairs like the Egyptian cotton, these short staples is hard to weave into cloth, and it was hard to remove the seeds from this this uh, new upland cotton. So it grew really well, incredibly well in this area, but it was hard to process and so a couple people grew it down here in the mid 1700s but not very many because it's so hard to process well what happens in 1793 is we're gonna see two inventions come out that are gonna make this short staple upland cotton incredibly profitable and you can mark these as the beginning of the cotton revolution although there's you know, not any set date for the start of this cotton revolution well, the first of the two inventions is going to be something like something called the cotton gin. That's what's displayed here. What the cotton gin was with a comb, essentially, where if you run short staple cotton uh, through the, the comb, it would take out the seeds and do the labor of, say, 10 people could be done by one or two people. So this is going to make it a lot easier to get this fiber, get the seeds out without tearing the fiber and you add that to something called the spinning jenny that's also going to come out around that time and what the spinning jenny does is it turns the short staple cotton into cloth much uh, uh, just as strong cloth as the Egyptian cotton and so this is going to make again this uh, this new type of cotton something you can make clothes out of which before the 1790s you, you couldn't because uh, it was too short to weave into cloth. So now spinning jenny, we can leave, weave it into cloth. And now because of this cotton gin, you can uh, get the state, uh, the seeds out of it much, much quicker. So this makes this cotton all of a sudden uh, incredibly profitable. And you add on to the fact that things that are kind of come out like the steamboat um, that are going to make shipping cotton up and down rivers much easier. Uh, this is going to uh, uh, make things easier and you add steam looms that will come out around this time as well where you can turn looms you don't have to do it by hand but instead you can do it with a machine that'll make producing cloth much easier so all these things mean that this short staple cotton that was essentially useless but grew well in the south is now going to become useful you can turn it into cloth and it's going to be something that everybody wants because again cotton superior cloth we don't think about it today but you know very very comfortable if you can get your hands on this then you're going to start you're you're going to want to get it so now anybody uh is going to want to get their hands on this cotton cloth and so what we'll see is a uh, huge demand for this cotton textile factories start being built in the north britain starts increasing its number of textile factories and you're going to have these americans start buying and occupying this land for the purpose of growing this new short staple cotton and this is going to be incredibly important to Texas because once you purchase Louisiana that's going to open up a lot of new land over here for settlement by the Americans and we'll see Americans just start pouring into this area to the point where tens of thousands are going to show up just between 1803 and 1810 most of them are going to be coming here to grow this cotton so uh, just the fact that cotton suddenly becomes profitable 
we'll just start sending Americans westward. So the Spanish are thinking we've got a little bit of time before Americans come in and start pressuring us. Well, that's not the case because right at the time America acquires Louisiana, uh, Louisiana becomes highly valuable. Again, Spanish couldn't find any reason to, uh, a way to get people up here. Well, right after they get rid of Louisiana, it suddenly becomes profitable. And not just Louisiana, because you can see this picture here, cotton is uh, can grow very well in Texas. And we're going to uh, hold that thought. So um, this is one big issue. People just start coming in left and right. And it's not just Americans or not just uh, European ancestry Americans. The Americans in the South, in the British colonies down here, African slavery had been used fairly extensively down here, although it was going away in the late 1700s. What happens once cotton becomes profitable, all of a sudden, end of the 1700s, beginning of 1800s, Southerners who were talking about getting rid of their slaves will now um, uh, continue to use slavery, not you know give up any ideas they, they had had in the late 1700s about ending slavery. And what we'll see is these uh, Southerners will start bringing their slaves with them as they start expanding onto this cotton land. So just think about this leads to a dramatic expansion of Americans uh, and their African slaves into these areas. And so now we're going to see African slaves and Americans right up next to Texas. And Spanish officials are going to have to figure out how the heck do we get this area here, Texas, with almost nobody in it, how do we get this population up so we can keep these Americans from, you know, taking over Texas, getting closer to our silver stuff? So we'll talk about that next time.